Okay, I'm going to go ahead and kick us off. Thank you everyone for being here on this fine Wednesday. Uh, we are here for today's session on social determinants of health and telehealth, a shared journey for patients and care teams. We are really excited to have this webinar for you all today. On the next slide, I'd like to just go over a few Zoom tips. Um, we are in a Zoom webinar, so everybody as a participant, you have been muted and your camera is off, but we do want to hear from you. So we are going to encourage all participants um, to use the chat and the Q&A to interact uh, with all of our presenters. Um, please ask your questions and um, we'd love to hear from you. Tell us where you're from. Um, also a note that today's session is being recorded. So if uh, you would like to share any of the content, we will have it on our YouTube uh, by the end of the day and would love uh, for you to revisit. As a reminder, today's session is purely for informational purposes. CTRC does not provide any legal advice and has no relevant financial interest, arrangement, or affiliation with any products or services that may be mentioned in today's webinar. Um, if you're not familiar with CTRC, we are funded by uh, HRSA's Office for the Advancement of Telehealth and also by California State Office of Rural Health. Uh, we are a program that provides unbiased, no-cost digital health resources and services uh, for California and beyond. And um, if you're not aware, OCHIN is a part of the OCHIN family of services. And I mention this uh, because our presenters today are part of our OCHIN family. So on the next slide, I'd like to introduce um, the wonderful presenters we have today. We're joined by Molly Volk, who is a practice coach at OCHIN. We're also joined by Angela Brown, um, who is a learning content designer at OCHIN and on the CTRC team, and also Lourdes Gonzalez, who is also a learning content designer and works with OCHIN and the CTRC family. Uh, so we're really fortunate to have you all here with us today and looking forward to your presentation. And with that, I'll hand it over to you guys. Thank you. Yay. Thank you, Aislinn. All right, so welcome all to our presentation on social determinants of health and telehealth, a shared journey for patients and care teams. And if you couldn't tell from my picture, I'm Lulu. So next slide, please. All right, so this is our agenda for today. First, we'll briefly talk about social determinants of health and social care interventions. Then we'll jump into the benefits of screening for social determinants of health using telehealth, as well as some considerations to keep in mind. Then we'll really get into the meat and potatoes of this presentation, the patient journey. And finally, we'll offer some resources and wrap things up. So I'll hand it over to Angie. Hey, everybody. So as we heard, CTRC is part of the OCHIN family. So we just want to offer a little bit of information about OCHIN. OCHIN is a national network dedicated to advancing equity. OCHIN supports safety net health organizations that serve over 6 million patients in 40 United States. And through this network, over 3 million SDOH screenings have been documented in the EHR, and, and that number can, can, continues to grow. Next slide. So that brings us to our topic for today, social drivers of health, or SDOH, and telehealth. Though many of us have some familiarity with SDOH, before we go any further, we'd like to kick off this session with some language setting. So when discussing SDOH, you might hear people use various terms interchangeably, such as social drivers, social risks, social determinants, et cetera. So let's break that down a little bit. When we're talking about one patient, we tend to say social risk or social needs. Health-related social needs, or HRSNs, is a term commonly used by government and payers to describe individual social risk factors, and this is what patients are screened for. This includes contextual factors of patients' lives, such as access to food, transportation, and housing stability. Collecting information on these risks can help primary care teams understand and address how these factors impact their patients' health. When we're talking about a panel or a population, we say social determinants or drivers of health. Since the term determinant sounds a little more fixed or intractable, a growing number of organizations and researchers prefer the term drivers, which evokes a more potential for change. Social drivers of health are experienced by everyone, 
They describe the influential factors in the environments of your past and present that contribute to your health and are often shaped by policy as well as social and structural norms. I'll hand it over to Molly to talk a little more about reasons to screen patients for this data. Thank you, Angie, and we'll move on to the next slide, please. All right, so again, health-related social needs are adverse social conditions that negatively impact a person's health or health care. And identifying these needs through screening can have a multifaceted impact. And so it can improve individual patient care by allowing for a more holistic approach to patient care, considering not just medical, but also social factors that affect health outcomes. It builds trust between the patient and their care team. So asking about and showing concern for a patient's life outside the clinic can augment the care team's connection to and communication with the patient. It informs healthcare utilization and costs. Understanding a patient's social needs can lead to more effective and efficient use of healthcare resources, potentially reducing costs. And it enhances community health. So by addressing individual social needs, healthcare providers can contribute to the overall health and well-being of the communities that they serve. Also reduces provider burnout. So higher perceived clinic capacity to address patient social needs is associated with lower burnout in primary care providers. And lastly, screening can support value-based care. So screening for health-related social needs aligns with value-based healthcare models that emphasize high-quality, cost-effective care tailored to the patient's context. Next slide, please. Emerging evidence suggests that social care programs don't affect health solely by connecting patients with social services and reducing socioeconomic barriers. In a recent paper, SIREN researchers used this evidence to develop a model that depicts multiple pathways through which social care interventions appear to operate, including reduced burden of social risk, emotional support, healthcare services connections, and tailored clinical care that appear to mediate the health and healthcare utilization impacts of social care programs. And so these pathways aren't mutually exclusive and may often be interconnected. For instance, feeling emotionally supported can lead patients to seek more connections with healthcare services. And then those connections can contribute to more tailored care and shared decision making. Next slide, please. So these are just some considerations for collecting health related social needs data. Universal screening reduces stigma by establishing it as a cultural norm that's part of your health center's approach to whole person care. It can relieve the care team of assumptions or biases about which patients they should and should not screen. And HITECH cites three S qualities that data must have to be actionable and interoperable. And so for data to have utility in the EHR, we need it to be structured, standardized, and systematically collected. On this slide, you'll also see some things to think about when implementing screening. So think about what tool you'll use to screen for health-related social needs. So some tools available are Prepare, the AHC, or others. Think about who will do the screening and how often. Is it the MA maybe during a telehealth visit? Does it happen annually? And then think about how you'll train your staff. So some methods that we've seen great success with are empathic inquiry, collaborative screening, motivational interviewing. And we'll talk more about that during the patient journey. Consider what you, you will do with the results. So will you connect patients with resources? Will you use the information to tailor their care? Will you share community level data with your partners? And then lastly, think about how you'll work with your community-based organizations or your partners. Think about building relationships with those folks, making referrals, making sure they're ready for those referrals. Um, and then if you're planning to use a tool like a social service resource locator. To help you answer some of these questions, we've linked um, an implementation guide at the end of the presentation that's available for you to work through some of these considerations. All right, and now I believe I'll pass it over. Oh, no, I'm up next too. So next slide, please. Great. Um, so across OCHIN, um, the, across our network of community health centers, there was a substantial decline in overall social determinants of health screening activity that was captured in the EHR that really corresponded with the drop in office visits starting in March of 2020. But this was or partially offset by a rapid increase in the proportion of SCOH screens that were conducted in telehealth visits. And in both April and May of 2020, more SCOH screens were conducted via telemedicine, including virtual visits with video and then also those conducted by telephone only than in all other encounter types combined. So by October, 2020, 
SDOH screening volumes went back up to pre-pandemic levels, but through mid-2021, telehealth visits continued to account for roughly 15 to 20 percent of monthly SUH screenings, which was up effectively from 0 percent at the start of 2020. All right, and now is where I pass it over to Lulu. Now you can give it to me. <laughs> so telehealth allows us to reach a broader swath of patients in remote and underserved areas, making it way easier to implement widespread SDOH screening programs. Telehealth can also provide enhanced privacy and comfort when patients are screened at home or in a familiar environment. It may help in reducing transportation barriers by eliminating that travel time to and from the clinic. It also allows for timely intervention by quickly referring patients to resources. So for example, in one study, patients who received telehealth-based outreach services were significantly less likely to visit the emergency room compared to patients who did not receive outreach efforts. Telehealth's ease of use also encourages consistent patient engagement and follow-up, which is pretty important in addressing SDOH. It can also integrate various tools and surveys that streamline the process of collecting SDOH data. And finally, telehealth allows for collaboration among providers, community health workers, and community resources to address those SDOH needs. Next slide, please. So although there are some obvious benefits to screening patients via telehealth, there are also some things to keep in mind. So for example, telehealth screenings may not be a good choice for obvious reasons for patients with limited access to the internet or those with a limited health uh, data plan or I'm sorry, a limited data plan, other screenings uh, might be a little bit better. And when screening through telehealth, it can also be hard to establish that special kind of trust that might come naturally during a face-to-face -face appointment. This is especially true when screening patients for SDOH as patients may think that they're being judged or that the telehealth appointment is less private. And so in a few slides, we'll offer some tips on how to establish trust with patients across the screen, how to explain the motivation behind screening to help those patients feel more at ease, and how to assure patients that the telehealth appointment is secure and that their information is confidential. Next slide, please. Okay, so to maximize the potential benefits of telehealth for those that it is well matched for, we'd like to share some promising practices for patient engagement with telehealth to help build patient buy-in and the willingness to endure technical challenges and the reduced intimacy of an in-office visit consider doing some of the following. So before the visit, ensure any staff that are involved have familiarity and uh, with the equipment and navigating the technology. Try to assess patients ahead of time for their level of digital literacy or comfort with the technology, and if needed, provide tools or assistance. Be prepared with a plan B in case tech issues can't be resolved in the moment, like connecting over the phone, via email, or even text. One on video, strong eye contact uh, conveys that you're listening and focused. That said, let the patient know that you'll have to look away from time to time to take notes. And proper lighting and a neutral background will help your video presence stay crisp and free of distraction. Your website manner is a reflection of your relational skills and has a great impact on the patient experience and their outcomes. So nonverbal communication, such as facial expressions, posture, and even hand gestures that are seen in the screen can influence the relationship as much as verbal cues and dialogue. Visuals or virtual standards of care, professionalism, and ethics don't really deviate from the in-person standards. Just as you would with an in-person visit, work with the patient to ascertain their goals, preferences, and their priorities. Active listening supports shared decision-making and strengthens that trust. Leverage approaches for empathic inquiry, motivational interviewing, and trauma-informed care. Ultimately, treating telehealth visits with the same commitment to patient-centered care as an in-person visit may enable digital health solutions to enhance your practice and improve outcomes. And I'll hand it to Molly for a light touch on reimbursement. Yes, thank you, Angie. Light touch indeed, because I'm by no means the expert, but you have a lot of great resources here through uh, the CTRC. These are just some quick notes. So the Telehealth Expansion Act of 2023 made pandemic era CARES Act telehealth rules permanent, and this legislation removed many cross-state restrictions for telehealth services. Um, reimbursement codes for SUH screening and action are included in the 2024 um, Medicare Physician Fee Schedule. 
Medicare adopted this for the physician payment beginning in 2024 to further address health-related social needs of Medicare beneficiaries. And SDOH risk assessments can be furnished uh, via telehealth through that. You can learn more about payment and regulatory policy on the CTRC website, which I've linked that page here on the slide. And then the American Telemedicine Association has an SDOH toolkit that has a collection of calculators, tools, and composite geographic disparities metrics that are available for your use. So please feel free to check out those resources. And next slide, please. Uh, standardized medical vocabulary like ICD-10Z codes can offer a way to aggregate and analyze SUH data across health centers, providers, and payers. So we did want to share some information about this. SUH coding is important for clinical management and outcomes reporting for payment reform and value-based payment, as well as other policy work. So SUH coding begins with care providers who often might need to understand how this data can be used to benefit not only the patient that they're serving, but also the broader population served by the organization. CMS has some helpful guidance for improving the collection of SUH data with C codes, and it's broken up into the five steps that you see here on this slide. So the first step is to collect SUH data. So any member of a person's care team can collect SUH data during any encounter. Data can be collected at intake through health risk assessments, screening tools, person provider interaction, and individual self-reporting. And then the next step is to document that SDOH data. So data need to be recorded in a person's electronic health record. SDOH data may be documented in the problem or diagnosis list, the patient or client history or provider notes. And care teams may collect more detailed SDOH data than current Z codes allow. Um, but this data should be retained and efforts are ongoing to close Z code gaps and standardize SDOH data. Step three is to map SDOH data to Z codes. So assistance is available from the ICD-10 CM official guidelines for coding and reporting. Coding, billing, and EHR systems help coders assign standardized codes. And coders can assign SDOH Z codes based on self-reported data, or information documented by any member of the care team if that documentation is included in the official medical record. So are you expected to know all the Z codes? Um, here at OCHIN, we have a best practice advisory pop-up that suggests appropriate Z codes to add to the problem list, depending on a patient's answers to an SUH screening. If you're not on OCHIN EPIC, I would encourage you to ask your EHR vendor how you can support your staff in this work. And step four is to use that SUH Z code data. So Data analysis can help improve quality of care, care coordination, and experience of care, identifying individual social risk factors and unmet needs. It can inform healthcare and services, follow-up and discharge planning, it can be used to trigger referrals to social services that meet individual needs, and it can you can track referrals between providers and social service organizations. Then lastly, step five is to report SDOHC code data findings. So, SDOH data can be added to key reports for executive leadership and board of directors to inform value-based care opportunities, and findings can be shared with social service organizations, providers, health plans, and consumer patient advisory boards to help identify unmet needs. As value-based care gains momentum, Z codes are going to be critical to collect SDOH data for both population health and reimbursement. Eventually, mapping SDOH data to Z codes can lead to a path of reimbursement, and by getting into the habit now, your organization can be set up for success. And so CMS is really trying to create a pathway for reimbursement for social needs activities. SDOH Z codes are diagnostic codes, so payers want this information because they want to know who has the need. And then in that physician fee schedule, which you talked about earlier, they're creating procedure codes. So the procedure code is who was screened and who received the services. And those procedure codes will need to be linked to a diagnostic code, and you'll be able to code for a procedure, link it to a diagnosis, and then get paid for that procedure. So again, by getting into the habit now, your organization can be set up for success. CTRC has a resource collection to help you understand various managed care telehealth billing and reimbursement guidelines, and we shared that link earlier, and we'll share it again on our resource page. Um, but that was a lot of information. I'm going to take a break and pass it over to Lulu. <laughs> Give it to me. Thank you, Molly. So in the next few slides, we're going to introduce you to a fictional patient named Jane. <laughs> you just saw a little peek of Jane there. And Jane is going to get screened for SDOH using telehealth. And through this journey, we'll learn how screening for SDOH can help providers adjust care plans and really meet the unique needs of their patients. 
All right. So everyone meet Jane. She's a fictional patient, a fictional patient, and this is her story. So Jane wakes up tired from tossing and turning all night at a temporary housing shelter. She hopes she can find a quiet place for her telehealth appointment so she can talk to her doctor about her persistent cough. Jane scheduled a telehealth appointment because she knew she didn't have transportation that she could rely on to see her doctor. While sitting down for breakfast at the shelter, Jane thinks about her life situation and worries about being embarrassed when she's asked about her address. Jane talks to the shelter staff and arranges to use a loaner laptop and a quiet office to have her telehealth appointment. Jane settles in and gets ready for her appointment. She reviews some of the materials that were shared by the clinic, including information on how to log into her appointment, how to turn on the camera, and some troubleshooting tips. And before she logs in, she looks down at her clothes and hopes no one will notice that they have not been laundered recently. She feels lost, but hopeful that she'll get some help for her cough. Next slide, please. All right, and I'm gonna take it from here. So Jane logs in, Jane checks in for appointment online and fills out the electronic patient registration form. She leaves address blank and she's feeling quite nervous. David, the medical assistant, joins Jane's telehealth appointment. Before the visit, David made sure he had a quiet and clean space to call in from. David warmly greets Jane while making eye contact with her through the screen. David explains that he has some questions that he'd like to ask her that her doctor and that her doctor will be joining her after they've finished. David asks Jane, would it be okay to ask you questions about your transportation, housing status, and access to food? He explains that we are having these conversations with patients so that we can understand better what might be affecting your health and well-being. We may be able to help you get connected to resources, though we can't guarantee that that will be the case. Even where we can't connect you to assistance, this information will help us partner with you to create a care plan that fits your life. Understanding what the patients we serve are experiencing also helps us to better advocate for our community. So Jane consents to the screening and David asks her if she has any questions before they begin. Jane does not. So David lets Jane know that he might look away from the screen while he takes notes, but he explains that it's because he wants to ensure he captures what she shares correctly. So David screens Jane for social risk factors. David is trained in patient-centered screening approaches and takes an empathic inquiry approach to the questions. He demonstrates active listening and uses language that makes Jane feel comfortable and supported even through the screen. David uses the prepare tool in the EHR to screen Jane and capture the information, but he takes a conversational approach. Jane tells him about her needs. While Jane shares her responses with David, David conveys understanding through attentive nonverbal listening cues, including eye contact and nodding reassuringly. Jane feels like David generally cares about her and she feels comfortable talking with him. After they wrap up the screening, David summarizes what he heard Jane share and lets Jane know that her provider will speak with her about the needs because their care team cares about Jane's well being. David steps away and lets Jane know the provider will be with her shortly. The EHR auto drops the appropriate Z code for Jane's housing and transportation needs into the chart. Next slide, please. All right. So before joining the visit, Jane's primary care provider, Dr. Cruz, reads Jane's chart. She then joins Jane and they discuss her cough and review her answers from the SDOH screen. Dr. Cruz suspects a bacterial infection and prescribes medication for Jane's cough that doesn't require refrigeration carefully considering Jane's living situation and taking some extra time to discuss treatment recommendations. Since Jane is at a higher risk due to staying at the shelter, she places an order for Jane for tuberculosis testing. To help arrange transportation, Dr. Cruz gives her information about the community's free medical rideshare program. Next, at the end of the visit, Dr. Cruz asks Jane if it's okay if one of their community health workers, Luis, can call her about addressing the, her housing needs, and Jane says okay. As a best practice, remember to ask patients about whether they are okay with receiving that follow-up care to increase patient trust and engagement. Dr. Cruz sends an internal referral over to Luis, who is able to begin searching for resources before contacting Jane. Next slide, please. So Luis accesses the Bidirectional Social Service Resource Locator, or, or SSRL, used at the clinic. He finds a housing agency that is accepting new clients and is excited to call Jane and discuss the potential connection. 
Luis calls Jane and talks to her about her situation. He lets her know he found a housing agency that might be able to help her with her need and asks permission to send them a referral. He tells Jane that she'll receive a text message to accept the referral by the end of the day. Jane is feeling hopeful and agrees. This sets off a chain of events. The housing agency accepts the referral. Jane receives a text notifying her of the referral. She accepts it, and the referral is recorded in the EHR. Next slide, please. All right, so at the end of this day, Jane settles in for another night at the temporary shelter, knowing that permanent housing options could be on the horizon. She appreciates feeling like she's a vital part of a care team that is prioritizing her needs. The following day, a representative from the housing agency contacts Jane and arranges an appointment for her to complete an application. Jane will be placed on a wait list for a housing program. A couple weeks later, Jane sees Dr. Cruz for an in-person follow-up appointment. Her cough has improved and her TB test was negative. Because the referral, uh, the referral for housing assistance was made with, through the EHR integrated SSRL, Dr. Cruz can see that Jane has had contact with the housing agency. She asked Jane about the agency and is relieved to hear that Jane submitted an application and is on the wait list for permanent housing. So to summarize, screening Jane for her social needs via telehealth has resulted in the opportunity for the clinic to support her through addressing not just her immediate health, but her longer term health related needs as well. Jane feels more hopeful knowing that she has a trusted care team that can offer empathy and make connections in her community where possible. So thanks for going along on this patient journey with us. We'd like to hear from you all. So I'll hand it back to Molly to lead us in a quick peer discussion. Thank you so much, Angie. So as she mentioned, we're now going to go into a peer discussion. And um, I believe for this discussion, you can make your comments in the chat or you can raise your hand for us to give you permission to unmute. But we have some questions here for you all on the next slide because when you've seen one screening and referral making workflow, you've seen one screening and referral making workflow. Um, what works well in one clinic might not work for another, but you also might be able to glean insights and learnings from um, your peers here today. So we are curious uh, for our first question, does your health center screen for social determinants of health? And if so, do you screen during telehealth visits? And I'm not sure if I can see the whole chat, um, but I'm counting on our friends at CTRC to let me know if we do get chats to come through. Yes, here's where I'm going to insert some uh, Jeopardy music as we wait for some <gasps> to come in. Um, but as a reminder, you can either post them in the chat or uh, simply raise your hand if you would like uh, to unmute and speak to us. And we do have one response from George saying, we do screen, but do not do telehealth screenings yet. That's great. And it looks like another one from Vicki currently screening in person only. I'm curious for those of you that do screen, um, would you consider screening through telehealth visits? George, absolutely. And I see um, one person put in that you do screen, you send the screening ahead of time, um, or they do it, the patient does it at the kiosk. I've seen that work really well um, for workflows where time is tight um, to have that screening completed ahead of time um, or have the patient fill it out at a kiosk. For um, those that would consider screening through telehealth, I'm curious, what facilitators or barriers do you sort of anticipate um, for screening through telehealth? Like what might go well um, or what maybe is preventing you from screening? Getting some more chats here. Looks like uh, one folks or one person will take the recommendation if possible to screen at telehealth visits. That's great. I hope that that workflow that we presented here today is helpful for you. Um, Denise says that we are also screening in person only, would definitely consider screening via telehealth. It 
has to be a telehealth visit for screening only since it does take time and trust to get this working. Absolutely, the trust piece is a really big component. Um, and I think that's why through the patient journey, we shared that it was sort of a mix of telehealth and in-person visits. And so um, after the screening, Jane did go in for an in-person visit. So it might have been maybe Jane went in for an in-person visit a year ago and maybe she was screened um, in, in the clinic and she got accustomed to being screened. And then maybe at her next appointment, which happened to be a virtual visit, she was then screened again. So maybe she was already comfortable with being asked those questions by her care team member. So maybe think about something like that, screening folks uh, through telehealth visits that have already been screened in person in the clinic. So they are familiar with that process. Denise, you shared, you think barriers would be trust and technical issues for patients. Absolutely. Angie or Lulu, any reflections uh, to add to some of these comments we have coming in? Well, I'm really curious to dig into what Denise said about patients having technical issues. Does that mean maybe they don't have Wi-Fi at home or their data plans are pretty limited? Like, What are the technical issues that come up for your patient populations? I can speak to that a little bit too. I know sometimes doing a dry run can really help if you have the time and resources to do so. Um, even patients that don't have financial barriers to ac accessing telehealth can have that digital literacy barrier or just get overwhelmed with the amount of clicking here and there. So sometimes kind of walking through the steps before the visit has been a good practice for clinics. And I see a question here, if you can share how the patient's responses have been with telehealth screening for SCOH. We do have that number that we presented earlier that we have about 15 to 20% of um, SCOH screenings happening through telehealth. So that's a fairly large, large number. Um, so I would assume that it's going well, but I don't have that. Um, I don't have that information, but would love to hear if there's anybody on the line that is screening using telehealth uh, to share a little bit more about how that's going. We do have two folks uh, who have raised their hand. Um, so okay. just go ahead and encourage them to go ahead and comment with us if you'd like to. Great. Hi. Hello. Can I speak now? Yes, absolutely. Welcome. Well, <clears throat> just a quick question. Actually, a couple of questions. How are the SDOH workflow <clears throat> with the CPT cuts reimbursed, reimbursed uh, with the referrals. So so my care team will <clears throat> do the SDOH screening and we assign a Z code to that screening. And then the referral, is is that all included into one, one reimbursement CPT code or how does that work? So I don't have the exact information on how that works for reimbursement. Um, I did believe I dropped a link in the answers, if you can see that for the CRTRC's resources for reimbursement. But Angie or Lulu, do you have any more clarifying information that we might be able to provide? I think it's just up and coming. I, I don't know. Um, it depends on the payer. And I think it's a work in progress. But I don't think I can speak, you know, with much expertise. Because I I saw that I saw that in the PFS just this year, not previous years. Mm -hmm. And That's I don't know if commercials follow what uh, Medicare came out in the PFS. Uh, so I was just wondering if uh, you've seen anyone uh, getting re reimbursed by applying whatever calling strategy. Right. Yeah. And I do think CMS is blazing the trail for commercial payers. Um, I haven't heard from folks yet on how it's going, um, boots on the ground, since it just, I think, was available here in January. But I am waiting eagerly to hear how that's going for health centers. And 
I'm hearing a lot of questions about reimbursement. And so I hope the CTRC folks are maybe taking notes and that could be another uh, great presentation opportunity. I know there's some really knowledgeable folks that could be brought in to speak to the specifics around reimbursement for SCOH, because that's a huge part about this work, getting paid to do it. it takes a lot of time and it takes a lot of staff capacity. So getting paid to do it is key. Thank you. Thank you for your great questions. And I do see the question about the Z code for SCUH. No, that's not only, that's not um, just applicable for telehealth visits. That's uh, I can I can um, read some more information here, but it can any any member of the care team can collect that information at any encounter. Um, hi, this is Denise at CMC. Um, I was just going to comment back on the um, the barrier of um, of like technical issues for patients. And so, I mean, when I think about our organization, we have you know thirty plus clinics, and there's quite a you know a diverse or huge range of you know patients. And so, some of when I think of like um, we are you know currently sometimes struggle with. Maybe it's our older population being able to use like technology and stuff. And I think this is great. I think this is, you know, it'd be great to use to, you know, gather a COH information via telehealth. But when I think of like, I think of some of our patients and I'm thinking like they'd be right on, you know, it'd be spot on. They wouldn't really have difficulty, but then there's another group that would really struggle with this. And then, you know, again, kind of building that trust that like we have to really kind of share the information, really explain what it is, is we are currently like working on ensuring that we're doing, um, you know, collecting, doing a screening tool for doing screening for STOH information. Um, we definitely have like a disclaimer or like explaining to them why we're asking you this information and, you know, why it's important to your overall health, health outcomes. So mm -hmm. people are a little, you know, since COVID, we kind of get like, oh, telehealth works, um, but people are still are a little hesitant you know, just with their general, um, with their, reg you know, their regular appointments. So this would, you know, some populations I see definitely, you know, buying in and being able to, but then others just like the technical thing for our older patients, I see as a, is a really big barrier. Yeah, you bring up a great point, Denise, that something that works for some folks might not work for others. I'm going to drop in the chat, what we shared through the patient journey, what David shared with Jane to preface the conversation and help explain why those questions are being asked. That comes directly from the Oregon Primary Care Association's Empathic Inquiry Conversation Guide, which is a really helpful scripting resource, um, which can be even more beneficial, I think, in telehealth visits where a, a staff member could have a script um, up in front of them to help with those conversations. So I'm gonna drop that in the chat we also have it linked in a slide, but that might be really helpful uh, for your organization to take a look at. That's great. Thank you. Absolutely. I'll also bring up that we've heard that clinics are, are sort of like leveraging their community health workers expertise to, to support patients with digital literacy. So if a patient has a telehealth appointment coming up and they're having some trouble or they're they're sort of afraid of the telehealth appointment that's upcoming. The CHW will sort of give them a call ahead of time, maybe go to their homes and meet with them and give them a very brief how-to on how to access the telehealth platform and, and some um, sort of like troubleshooting tips that, um, you know, some troubles that they can expect during the appointment possibly. So CHWs are really, are really where it's at. They're helping people with so many needs and, and technology is just one of them. Thanks, Lulu. I just realized I sent that resource to the panelists. I'm going to send it to everybody. All right. Again, that's the script um, to preface the conversation, and that comes directly from the OPCA's Patient Centered Social Needs Screening Conversation Guide, which is a resource that I love. Um, to help staff at organizations have these tough conversations with patients, because that is that's a huge barrier.
I'll just pop in from CTRC on our team. Um, we do have some resources uh, from um, the CTRC talking about hybrid virtual care models and reimbursement uh, resources. We have quite a ton on our website, uh, but I will make a note that uh, we are in kind of a transition period with a lot of announcements and things. So stay tuned for updated reimbursement uh, education and materials coming very soon. Um, if you're not subscribed to the CTRC's newsletter, uh, now's a great time to do so um, to make sure you are staying informed of all these important updates. Um, and I do have one more person who has raised their hand, so I'll go ahead and make sure. Great, thank you. It looks like Rudy raised their hand. Rudy, you can come off mute and ask a question at any time. Hello. Hi, Rudy. We can hear you now. Yes, thank you so much. Uh, first of all, um, uh, my name is Rudy. I've been uh, involved in a uh, social drivers, social determinants of health for uh, quite a long time. Uh, first of all, ladies, uh, let me just say this is a fantastic uh, presentation, especially that uh, example with the patient. It really did bring uh, to the fore everything that you 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 suggest that should be used in that interview. And um, I also want to say that I found California's uh, TRS Center to be probably second to none in the United States. And we do interact with many people across the United States. Um, I might be a bit biased because I live in California, uh, not too far from Disneyland. Um, maybe I can share a couple of things. And this has to do with the first question that we had. Um, and this relates to reimbursement. Um, this SDOH is currently viewed as not reimbursable by most plans, value-based care, commercial, um, but it is indeed resource uh, intensive. And um, as uh, Molly mentioned, um, yes, CMS is in fact currently looking at uh, offering some level of reimbursement and that of course will filter through both commercial as well as our risk adjustment plans. What, however, is, is important here is that these SDOH uh, codes and procedure codes have tremendous importance on the quality and STARS side of your business in terms of NCQA HEDIS as well as the CMS STARS. So where they may not have direct reimbursement from a payer, it certainly does enhance your quality standing in terms of uh, selection as a provider or a plan. And for those people that actively participate, you do in fact receive bonuses for uh, demonstrating that kind of uh, involvement, that kind of participation in SDOH. Um, some of the uh, challenges that I or we have found over the years with SDOH, first of all, has to do with uh, digital literacy, as mentioned by uh, Angela and um, Lulu. Uh, I love I love Lulu's abbreviated name. Um, uh, for the most important thing. Secondly, what we have found on this would probably we've been tracking over the last 16 months. Um, with the rise in online scams, we find a lot of people quite hesitant now. And, you know, Molly has reinforced the need to establish that level of trust. Um, so that that is possibly the, the two common barriers that we found. And of course, the third barrier is uh, because it is a very resource intensive thing and it's not current com currently reimbursable. Um, there is some hesitancy. Um, I will, however, recommend that people choose to follow the recommendations here. Um, as this uh, team mentioned, it's good to get the practice in. And it actually be becomes quite uh, secondhand um, to put the, the entire 
patient intake process. And this can be done at an annual visit, a comprehensive annual exam, or perhaps a, a post-discharge visit. Um, I will also say that unfortunately, not all states, counties, or cities in the United States have the resources necessary to assist once we as providers provide that SDOH um, information. So that might be something you want to balance. Um, you don't want to promise patients or bed potential beneficiaries that we can deliver on housing, we can deliver on food, um, make a, you know, to, an effort to partner with those that are available in your communities, and it may actually be governmental. We found a lot of uh, um, positive uh, interaction with the non-governmental bodies, churches, um, non-profits, even individuals. We have a situation, believe it or not, in which some of uh, our employees actually will go and collect uh, food supplies from various food banks for a couple of our patients. Um, and we've all, we've been able to leverage the telehealth and the SDOH tie-in to do these things. Um, uh, I I hope that uh, these these few tips people might find helpful. Um, I apologize if I uh, spoke too much. Um, and um, no. I, and believe it or not, I really do look like that in my avatar picture. <laughs> It, it was done by one of my friends out in Silicon Valley. And uh, yeah, I really do look like that, except I'm a lot older. Incredible. Rudy, thank you so much for everything that you shared. Um, you're hired. You can do a presentation with us anytime. Thank you for reiterating so many of the important points and sharing yeah. your real life. You know what? I, I really appreciate that. And for all, you know, but we probably uh, should touch bases after. I, I, I have found that... Um, I, the things that I know and as and the things that I grow is a direct result of those things that I give away. And um, those that so I I would be very very happy to, to assist in any way. And um, yeah. Uh, so uh, thanks again so much. What a wonderful presentation! As I said, I've not seen anything compare comparable to anyone else in the United States. And um. That's not just because I'm a Californian, but also, as I say, I've been working in this area for well over 10 years. Um, and 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 so, as I say, thank you very, very much for choosing this uh, forum and this opportunity to share. Clearly, you ladies know your business. And, and thank you so much. Thank you, Rudy. Thank you for everything you shared. With that, I think that's the perfect segue into our summary where we can um, summarize the different takeaways and I'll pass it over to Lulu and Angie to do so. Yeah, I don't know that I could follow Rudy up, <laughs> but I'll do my best. All right, so some takeaways. So we learned that adverse social determinants of health are health harming contextual factors of patients' lives, such as food, transportation, and housing instability. Uh, we learned that collecting information on these risks can help primary care teams understand and better address how these factors impact their patients' health. And we also learned that screening for social determinants of health can be done at telehealth visits. All right. And so payers are embracing telehealth and digital tools to address SDOH. It might be slow moving, but it is happening. And infrastructure and reimbursement is coalescing. Consider the journey of your patients and care teams as you craft your workflow to identify barriers and facilitators. Consider running small tests of change and scale when you're ready. And I might add a sixth bullet here that if telehealth isn't the solution, that's okay. You can still do all of these wonderful things in person. And next slide, please. We just wanna share as noted throughout the presentation, some of the resources. This list has some great ones to help you advance this work. Please feel free to reach out to any of us or those at uh, CTRC and we'll be happy to help. And we'll hand it back to Aislinn to close us out. Thank you. Okay, well, that was really great. Um, I'm really thrilled with the interaction um, that we had there and great presentation. Uh, clearly this topic is, is so, so valuable. So uh, we're really appreciative to Angela and Molly and Lulu for joining us um, and sharing these insights today. Um, I definitely agree that the patient example um, was really helpful. Um, so I loved that. 
Um, I will do a quick plug that uh, if you want to hear from this group again, we do have a second August webinar coming up on um, the 28th. Join us for using patient journeys to improve digital health adoption. Um, lastly, I'll just remind everyone that the slides and the recording of this session will be made available. Uh, you will get an email from the CTRC team by the end of today uh, to access all of these materials. Um, and feel free to reach out if you have follow-up questions for the team or for any of our presenters here today. Shoot us an email and we will gladly get you connected. Um, and that is it. So on the next screen, I'll just say thank you uh, to everyone for being here today. And most importantly, thank you to our presenters uh, for sharing their insights. And we hope all of you have a great rest of your Wednesday. Thank you.